Okay. Before we have our quiet time, let's all get on the same page. If you're reading from the Sparkly book, it's page 427, a new section entitled The Basis of the Dream. In the second edition, it's page 375, again, The Basis of the Dream. In the first edition, page 350, The Basis of the Dream. If you're reading from the JCIM edition, it's page 178, again, The Basis of the Dream. And if you're reading from the CIMS edition, it's page 359, The Basis of the Dream. Okay. Let's take a few moments to be quiet together. Good evening. And welcome to everyone who's joining us on the internet. You know, there was a reason that something came upon a midnight clear. There was a reason that the Christ child was born. And it was for something more than conveying to everyone that there was a God that loved them while they were experiencing relative misery. There was more reason to it than to make it halfway comfortable without changing the miserable ongoing experience called the human condition. Everyone has used the Christmas story. Everyone has used my life as a way to make the human condition more comfortable without realizing that the whole point of my showing up was to convey something that would cause an aha a realization that the human condition was not your birthright and was not what was natural to you and that it was to come to an end. That 
It was to be transformed, that your experience of being was to be transformed. You know? I said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And I conveyed that those things that I have done, you would do, and greater things. Why? A special gift? To a poor mortal? No, because you're my brothers and you're my sisters. We are family, and we have the same father, we have the same inheritance. You were not shortchanged by the father while I was given everything. I came to transform your minds by presenting something that the experiences of your ancestors weren't able to give you. They weren't able to give you the steps out of the dream, the steps out of the human condition. And yet, that's your birthright. And I came to present you with it, to change your minds. Now, what we are going to be talking about tonight describes the Christmas gift, describes the gift I came to give. It tells you how to step out of the dream. It helps you understand that you're not bound and how to step out of the dream. It wasn't meant for you to not get the point for 2012 years. It was meant for you to get the point when I was there when I was with you on the planet, while I was talking with you. And it is the message that was supposed to get through with anyone who managed to become defenseless enough to hear my voice down through the 2012 years. So that what? You didn't have to wait until 2012 to wake up. You see, the reason I came was to promote change. The reason I came was to help inspire in you the desire to change and not just continue to repeat your ancestors' patterns and thoughts and concepts. Now, if indeed I came to teach you something, it means that you were capable of being taught. It means that you have always been capable of grasping what I'm saying. It's always been possible for you to grasp the meaning of the love you are embraced with by the Father. A love which, when you let yourself feel it, inspires you out of your limited concepts, out of your willingness to just suffer through the human condition with the inspiration that you let yourself have by virtue of thinking about Christmas, thinking about the birth of the Christ, thinking about the things that I said. You're not to make suffering more palatable by means of what I shared. You're supposed to let the things I shared lift you out of it, out of the suffering, out of the human condition, and into the conscious experience of what? The kingdom of heaven and your holiness. That's what. And you know what? You don't have to wait until 2012 to do it. It can be tonight. 
It can be tomorrow night. The gift of awakening isn't going to be given to you in 2012. The gift of awakening was given to you by the Father in His creation of you. And it was emphasized, it was embellished, it was shared more completely when I joined you, apparently in your dream, and gave you what it took to wake up. And I'm here tonight, and the Course is with you every day, every night, for you to refer to and remind yourself. So, let's remember, you might say, that what we're going to discuss tonight was the whole reason there was a manger scene. A whole re the whole reason there were wise men. The whole reason that there was my life and my teaching and my involvement with my brothers and sisters. This is a holy instant. This is an instant in which the holiness of being which it was my purpose to remind you of 2,011 years ago, so let's not let the holiness of the instant we're in escape us. Now, just a moment. We're in a new section called The Basis of the Dream. Well, without reading, after all the discussion we've had together, what do you think the basis of the dream would be? What is the basis of uh, the experience of illusion? That you have been taught you're in the middle of. The basis of the dream is the decision you made to get a divorce from your father. In other words, the basis for the dream is an imagination that you can exist independently in your own right, coupled with the decision to enact that with commitment, such commitment that it caused you to neglect to remember, in other words, to forget your holiness, your birthright, who your father, mother is, and the experience of the Kingdom of Heaven. In its place, as we've discussed many times, you, you found the kingdom of heaven, which was the only thing available to you to experience, you found yourself experiencing it as the world and universe, the material world and universe. You found it to be all of the definitions you chose to give to it. And so it moved you into a very active, conscious experience that was based in ignorance, that was based in nothingness which you then filled with the definitions you wanted to give everything because you thought that making those definitions and making them real would make you real in your own right, independent from who you really were and unconscious of reality. Now, that's the basis of the dream.
in that enactment, you seemed to create a duality. Reality was one, the kingdom of heaven, and alongside it, an imaginative state of being in which through imagination meanings were given to everything in the kingdom of heaven while ignoring that it was the kingdom of heaven. So there was the conscious experience of reality was one state of being and the unconsciousness of reality as another state of being. Those are the only two choices that could possibly seem to have been made and it's awakening from the two of them back into the conscious awareness of the only one that is real that constitutes your salvation. That doing that is the whole reason that there was a first Christmas. Do you understand? So, it's not a complicated problem. The only complexity there is to it is all of the little intellectual defenses and beliefs and confidences with which you have wrapped up all of your meanings that you have given to the kingdom of heaven that make it seem to be something else. And it's getting you to release all these little definitions and meanings and convictions and confidences that it is my task to do. And the means of doing it is simple. It's the two-step. It's the holy instant. Therefore, you could say that the whole reason there was a first Christmas, the whole reason the Christ showed up was to reveal the holy instant as the way home, as the way out of the dreams and illusions that you were bound by. That's the simplicity. That is the capital M message of Christian, of Christmas. Now, the basis of the dream. Does not a world that seems quite real arise in dreams? Night dreams. Yet think what this world is. It is clearly not the world you saw before you slept. Meaning during the daytime before you went to bed. Rather it is a distortion of the world planned solely around what you would have repre- what you would have preferred here you are free to make over whatever seemed to attack you and change it into a tribute to your ego which was outraged by the attack you see in the daytime when you're awake in the real world um things happen that make you feel vulnerable, that take advantage of you, that hurt you. And you can't seem to do anything about it. But boy, the moment you fall asleep, you have free reign over everything. You can make everything be the way you want it. This would not be, in other words, a tribute to your ego, which was outraged by the attack. This would not be your wish unless you saw yourself as one with the ego. The ego. This one that uh, is looking at everything and giving definitions to it all by himself. Yeah, It's not an ego out there different from you. It's just you behaving inconsistently with what you are and who you are. Ignoring your holiness and defending yourself against all the misery you see when What you're seeing isn't embraced by your holiness, but is embraced by the fear you experience because you're ignoring your holiness. You see? 
This would not be your wish unless you saw yourself as one with the ego which always looks upon itself and therefore on you as under attack and highly vulnerable to it. Really, relatively simple. Now, dreams that you have at night are chaotic because they are governed by your conflicting wishes. And therefore, they have no concern with what is true. You see, I'm afraid, I feel vulnerable, and so I choose to see everything as though it's against me. My wish is to see that everything is against me. But at the same time, there's something in me that I don't have a whole lot of control over called love. And so it wants, it wants equality and it wants to generate balance without abandoning the need to assert oneself to protect himself. So these are conflicted needs which are embraced side by side. And there are many extenuations of that. They are the best example. In other words, dreams are the best example you could have of how perception can be utilized to substitute illusions for truth. When you compare your daytime life to the dreams you have at night, the dreams at night provide wonderful illustrations of the ego and of how the ego works, how your mind works when it has chosen to ignore its divinity, to ignore your birthright. You do not take them seriously, dreams. You do not take them seriously on awaking because the fact that reality is so outrageously violated in them becomes apparent. In other words, the reality of your daytime activities. When you wake up, it's so obvious that uh, what happened in the dream outrageously violates the daytime reality. That becomes apparent and frees you from whatever hold they had on you while you were having the dream. Yet, they are, the dreams are, a way of looking at the world. In other words, they are a way for you to look at the world different from the way you're looking at it during the daytime and suffering from what you can't control. They are a way of looking at the world and changing it to suit the ego better, to suit the you who wants to govern and determine what, every, what everything is better. They, the dreams, provide striking examples both of the ego's inability to tolerate reality, reality of the daytime. How do you know it can't tolerate it? Because at nighttime, it changes reality around to make you not guilty, to make you not vulnerable, to put the blame out there, to make the conflict seem to be not your responsibility, while at the same time getting justice in your dreams. They provide striking examples both of the ego's inability to tolerate reality and your willingness to change reality on its behalf. During your dream time, you change all of the characteristics of the reality going on in the daytime to suit you and to suit your purposes, which are not at all in alignment with your Father or with your holiness. So, dreams provide you 
your night dreams provide you with a clarity about the ego and a clarity about the human condition. You do not find the differences between what you see in sleep and on awaking disturbing. You don't. Sometimes a nightmare lingers. Sometimes a very, very, very fearful experience in the dream lingers. But you know it was a dream. You know it was different from the reality of your being awake in the day. You do not find the differences between what you see in sleep and on awaking disturbing. You recognize that what you see on waking is blotted out in dreams. Yet, on awakening, you do not expect it to be gone. Let's understand that. You recognize that what you see on waking, the reality of daytime, is blotted out in dreams. Yet, on awakening, you do not expect that because it was blotted out in your dreams, it will be gone when you wake up. You see? Again, you recognize that what you see on waking is blotted out in dreams, yet on awakening you do not expect it to be gone. In dreams you arrange everything. Obviously. People become what you would have them be, and what they do you order. Now, pay attention as you read through this, <clears throat> because you can understand this and you can see the actuality of it. And it's just a description of the night dream. Don't make it more complicated by trying to apply it in other areas. This is a very simple explanation of the experience of dreaming. Night dreams. People come, become what you would have them be, and what they do, you order. No limits on substitution is laid upon you. You can make that guy the worst bastard there ever was, or the greatest saint there ever was, or any degree in between, and you can even imagine that that one is schizophrenic, and he can be the greatest guy one minute and the worst guy the next minute, and, and uh, uh, you can make anything out of him. You can make substitutions of what he is, freely, with carefree abandon, no limits on substitution is laid upon you. For a time it seems as if the world were given you to make it what you will. You do not realize that you are attacking it, trying to triumph over it and make it serve you. When you're having the dream, you do not realize that you are attacking the world you were living in the daytime by determining that it was something different, with different meanings, that did not make you guilty of anything, but made you the innocent one who, which justified trying to achieve justice and make someone else guilty so you would be exonerated. Not realizing that the only way to be exonerated from what's going on in the dream is to have your alarm clock go off or have something in you rouse you so that you wake up on your bed and realize you didn't need to be exonerated from anything because the whole thing was a dream. You see? Dreams, night dreams, we're still just talking about simple night dreaming. Dreams are perceptual tantrums in which you literally scream, I want it thus. You see, I'm going to take charge here. I'm going to make things be the way they ought to be. And thus it seems to be. And yet, 
The dream cannot escape its origin. What's the origin of the dream? The origin of the dream is, Father, I'd rather see things my way. Father, I want a divorce. Father, I am going to determine for myself what everything is. That's the origin of the dream. That's the point at which you have convinced yourself that you became the authority and that all the meanings you give to everything are the meanings they have. Anger and fear pervade it. The dream. And in an instant, the illusion of satisfaction is invaded by the illusion of terror. Uh, your dreams are never dependable. They're never stable. They never, ever provide a constant, unchanging perspective. And when things change suddenly, having no connection with what went before, you don't even question it. For the dream of your ability to control reality, which is why you got the divorce in the first place, by substituting a world which you prefer is terrifying. You remember that we've discussed the fact that the moment you did that, two things came into play. Fear and guilt. Fear and guilt are the flavor of everything that follows. They are the flavor and the context of all of your dreams. You see? Your attempts to blot out reality by giving it your own meanings and definitions are very fearful, but this you are not willing to accept. And so, you substitute the fantasy that reality is fearful, not what you would do to it. That you do during the daytime. You substitute the fantasy that reality your daily life is fearful, not what you would do to it. In other words, what you would do to it is not what is fearful to you, even though that is what makes it fearful. And thus is guilt made real. When you said, Father, I would rather see it myself, I'd rather do it my way, I'd rather give definitions to everything, I want a divorce, God's reality became a fearful thing to you because it tended to get in the way of your ability to determine what everything is on your own. And it it, coupled with fear and guilt, caused you to perceive your situation as calling for defense on your part against the God's honest truth, reality, the kingdom of heaven. When you said, in response to that, the suffering I'm experiencing is not because of anything I did, but because of all the fearful things I see going on in the world, as I look through it, look to it, look at it through my independent stance, you hid from yourself the conscious awareness of what is real. You established yourself in the state of independence which is flavored by fear and guilt, and in the blotting out of your experience of what everything truly is, you made guilt real for you. You made the guilt that was inseparable from independence substantial and actual for yourself. 
because you blocked from your view the way out. Simple as that. Dreams show you that you have the power to make a world as you would have it be, and that because you want it, you see it. Now, these are your night dreams. They prove that to you. It happens with every dream you have. And while you see it, you do not doubt that it is real. Right? When you're in the middle of the dream, you do not doubt that it is real. Yet here is a world, clearly within your mind, that seems to be outside you. Right? You find yourself in the middle of a world that you are ordering around, that you are creating with your mind, and it seems to be outside of the, the you you experience in the dream. And this it's, it's a hostile world which you're getting the better of, and there's nothing to stop you getting the better of one way or another, unless you wake up prematurely and don't have a chance to get justice. <laughs> oh. Here is a world clearly within your mind that seems to be outside. You do not respond to it as though you made it, nor do you realize that the emotions which the dream produce must come from you. Mind you, we're still just talking about every night, every day. <laughs> we're just talking about ordinary dreams that you experience at night or whenever you're sleeping and having a dream. It is the figures in the dream and what they do that seem to make the dream. You do not realize that you are making them act out for you. For if you did, the guilt would not be theirs and the illusion of satisfaction would be gone. You'd be stuck with the conscious awareness of what was promoting all of this. And you would not be able to blame anything else and you would realize that a change in you is what is called for. <clears throat> in dreams, these features are not obscure. You seem to awaken and the dream is gone. Now here's the key point. <clears throat> Yet what you fail to recognize is that, was that what caused the dream has not gone with it. The basis of the dream that you had at night has not gone along with the dream when you wake up in the morning. Your wish to make another world that is not real remains with you. It remains with you. I'm adding this. It remains with you because it was present before you went to sleep. It was part and parcel of the way you were experiencing the day time, the day before you had the night dreams. And it's still there. And what you seem to wake to is but another form of this same world you see in dreams. Now here's where the whole reason for the first Christmas becomes crystallized because this is the message that I came to share, to promote awakening out of the dream then. That was the point then. Let that sink in. Because if you realize that, realize that that was the point then, you will realize that it is still the point. And you will begin to engage or participate in the meaning of Christmas in a fuller way than you have in the past. Listen again. 
your wish to make another world that is not real remains with you when you wake up at, in the morning. And what you seem to wake to, your daily life, is but another form of this same world you see in dreams. So, it's saying that you wake up from your night dream and in the daytime when you thought you weren't dreaming at all, you're still dreaming. And ultimately, what you can glean from your night dream, which is so utterly clear to you as to its meaning, you can transfer to your day dream, which you call normal, awake mentality. Your wish to make another world that is not real remains with you, and what you seem to wake to is but another form of this same world you see in dreams. Here is the point of release that could seem to be difficult to accept. All your time is spent in dreaming, whether it's at night or in the daytime. That's good news, because once you accept that, once you consider it as a real possibility, it is possible for you to spontaneously become released from your way of perceiving everything that causes you to suffer and keeps you bound to suffering. And the point is the release and the point of Christmas, that first Christmas, was to cause that release. Your sleeping and your waking dreams have different forms, and that is all. Their content is the same. They, your night dream and your daytime life, which is actually a daydream, they are your protest against reality and your fixed and insane idea that you can change it. In your waking dreams, and, and let me say this, don't listen to what I'm saying and consider the reality of it and then say, wow, I must really be insane. Wow, I'm, I'm a lost soul. Wow. And imagine all kinds of negative definitions about you that would simply cause you to neglect to take a simple... Um, intelligent look, dispassionate look at the nature of a night dream and then be consider, then consider looking at your daytime activities and see similarities in it and realize that just as there is something to wake up to from your night dream, there is something to wake up to from your day dream. That's the message of Christmas. In your waking dreams, the special relationship is your determination to keep your hold on unreality and to prevent yourself from wakening. From waking. Listen again. In your waking dreams, the special relationship is your determination to keep your hold on unreality. And what's a special relationship? It's a relationship you engage in with another while leaving God out. In other words, it is a focused, unintelligent, practice, which at the bottom line, hidden out of sight, has as its purpose keeping you unconscious of God, keeping you unconscious of your divinity, keeping you unconscious of your partners or the divinity of the one you're in relationship with, you see. That's what a special relationship is. 
It has as its bottom line function the purpose of keeping you absolutely unconscious of what it takes to wake up. Simple. Don't let it get more complicated than that. In that clarity, it's easy to change your mind. In your waking dreams, the special relationship is your determination to keep your hold on unreality and to prevent yourself from waking. And while you see more value in sleeping than in waking, you will not let it go. Destructive. That's destructive. The answer to that is the two-step, the holy instant, which is the means of letting in the experience of a holy relationship because you've chosen to abandon your independence and say, Father, what is the truth here? Holy Spirit, help me look at this one I'm in relationship with and remember not what he did yesterday, not what he did 10 years ago, not, not what his whole family has done to my family for generations, but what is the truth about him now? Help me have the experience of who he truly is, free of my definitions and confidences and arrogant judgments of him. I want to know the truth. I want to look at him or her and I want to remember God. Now, the Holy Spirit, ever practical in his wisdom, accepts your dreams and uses them as means for waking. You would have used them to remain asleep. We once said that the first change before dreams disappear is that your dreams of fear are changed to happy dreams. That is what the Holy Spirit does in your special relationship. And brings it into focus more specifically as you insist on remaining true to the revealing of what is real that the Holy Spirit brings to you. He does not destroy it, nor snatch it away from you. Your special relationship will remain not as a source of pain and guilt, but as a source of joy and freedom. Of course, it will not be for you alone, for therein lay its misery, you see. The human condition, that which called forth the midnight clear and the manger and the wise men. That which brought it forth was that the correction of your divorce from your father and your insistence upon independence would be corrected and you would be freed from undeserved misery and an undeserved unconsciousness of your holiness as an experience. Your special relationship will remain not as a source of pain and guilt, but as a source of joy and freedom. 
it will not be for you alone, for therein lay its misery. As its unholiness kept it a thing apart, its holiness will become an offering to everyone. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. A change of perception. A change of behavior. A change in which you consider and experience your brother and sister. That doesn't call on anything other than peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. Goodwill. That thing that happens when you look in your brother's eyes and remember God. That's the meaning of good will toward men, toward your brother, toward your sister, toward your enemy. Your special relationship, having been given over to the Holy Spirit by your practice of the holy instant will be a means for undoing guilt in everyone blessed through your holy relationship. Blessed by your getting the Christmas message, by your getting the point. Today, here, now. It will be a happy dream and one which you will share with all who come within your sight. You know, when you see something clearly and when you're filled with joy, you can't help but share it. It just happens. And sometimes it's your lack of speaking, your lack of doing something in a circumstance that another recognizes you ordinarily would have had great reaction with great volatility. Volatility. And they are blessed because they know the difference. And they are glad to have been with you in that moment and not experienced, quote, the old you, unquote. Through it, the blessing which the Holy Spirit has laid upon it will be extended. Think not that he has forgotten anyone in the purpose He has given you. It's not a special gift. It's not something you're getting exclusively. Man, when you get His gift, when you feel the truth of God's perspective, everyone is touched by it. It's that simple. Think not that he has forgotten anyone in the purpose he has given you, and think not that he has forgotten you to whom he gave the gift. For what you give, you get to keep. You are blessed by that which you bless others. That you are blessed by having received because you chose to abandon your independence and say, Father, what's the truth here? Holy Spirit, help me look in my brother's eyes and remember what's really there. Remember God. He, the Holy Spirit, uses everyone who calls on Him as means for the salvation of everyone. And He will waken everyone through you who offered your relationship to Him. And what if it's not just you, but you and you and you and you and everyone doing this? If you but recognized His gratitude or mine through His or the rest of the brotherhoods who is experiencing the transformation of you. For we are joined in one purpose, being of one mind with Him. Let not the dream, the dream 
the daydream that you are experiencing as a result of not having fallen asleep at night, but as a result of having claimed independence from your father. Let not the dream, the daydream, take hold to close your eyes. It is not strange that dreams can make a world that is unreal. That's not strange. The wish to make it is incredible. <laughs> the wish to make a world that is unreal is what's insane, is what's impossible to accomplish, making, making it incredible, not credible, and outlandish. Your relationship has become one in which the wish has been removed when you engage in the holy instant and establish a holy relationship and let it infill you. When you do, your relationship has become one in which the wish to make a world that is unreal. Your relationship has become one in which the wish has been removed because its purpose has been changed from, from one of dreams to one of truth. Now, when it happens, you are not sure of this because you think it may be this, the happy dream, when everything seems to be going beautifully and it has new meaning for you. You are not sure of this because you think it may be this that is the dream. You are so used to choosing between dreams, you do not see that you have made, at last, the choice between the truth and all illusions. Because that isn't clear to you, it's possible to think that the transition itself is a dream and that you haven't really begun to awaken yet. Heaven is sure. This is no dream. Its coming means that you have chosen truth and it has come because you have been willing to let your special relationship meet its conditions, the conditions of heaven. You've let your relationship meet its conditions because you've said, I want to know the truth, Father. I want to have the experience of the reality, the holiness of my brother, Holy Spirit. Help me, you see. When you do that, you are relaxing. You are yielding up your control so that your relationship might meet the conditions of heaven. Blessing you, blessing your brother, and blessing everything and everyone. In your relationship, where you have grasped the meaning of Christmas, engaged in the holy instant, the Holy Spirit has gently laid the real world. The Holy Spirit has gently laid the real world in your relationship. And think about it. If your relationship isn't exclusive, but shared with the whole brotherhood, then It's in that universal context that the Holy Spirit has gently laid the real world and more unity is experienced and more joy is felt because more of the brotherhood is joined and loneliness for lack of contact is no longer being felt by those who were awake. In your relationship, the Holy Spirit has gently laid the real world. 
the world of happy dreams from which awaking is so easy and so natural. For as your sleeping and your waking dreams represent the same wishes in your mind, so do the real world, the God's honest real world, the kingdom of heaven, and the truth of heaven join in the will of God. The dream of waking is easily transferred to its reality. For this dream comes from your will, joined with the will of God. And what this capital W will would have accomplished has never not been done. What does that mean? It means you are not you are neither behind the point of perfection nor advancing toward it. You are at that point and must understand yourself therefrom. And that is the meaning of Christmas. Let it bless this holiday season. I love you all. And I look forward to being with you next time.